Welcome, Will Fordenberry, to the Self-Employment Success Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate you reaching out and asking me to jump on. This will be fun. Yeah, I'm excited about it. Um, this is a special episode for me to all the listeners because Will is actually one of my longest. I mean, he is my longest friendship in life. We've been friends since middle school. What is that, We've 20 years now? Other- yeah. Yeah, which is kind of crazy. Yeah. Wow, it is 20 years. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, we've just walked through a lot of life together. We've we stood in each other's weddings. Um, and this is just a dear, dear friendship of mine. Um, so I'm excited to have him on here. And also in my own business, Will personally was a catalyst for me feeling like, all right, I can do this because he started a business. And is, like if Dick Bozo can do it, I can definitely do it. Yeah, if, if that <laughs> if that idiot can do it, clearly yeah. anybody can do it. <laughs> yeah, super yeah. easy and Will can do it. Yeah. And that's, that's not true, but I just felt like, okay, he took a risk and is doing it and I'm seeing all the benefits of it. There's kind of like an up close and personal view of, you know, the ups and downs and benefits and success that can be achieved by owning your own business by having you kind of on the the front lines doing it before me. So um, I'm excited for this conversation and, you know, all that you have to share, because I think you have a lot to share about this topic and have, have achieved a lot of success and, worked really hard for it and are really good at what you do. So tell Thank us you. a little bit about you. Tell us a little bit about your business as it stands uh-huh. today. Um, and we'll go from there. Sweet. Okay. So yeah, my name is Will. I'm married to a wonderful person named Joy. And we have a almost 13 month old named Easton. Um, so that's about me. Uh, about my business, I do motion graphics, motion design, which is essentially animation uh logo animation video animation things like that it's sort of like a very niche section of video editing like you could think of video editing world and i'm kind of like a very specialized version of that specifically focused on animation and uh events a lot of the clients i work with i do a lot of like corporate events led wall content so i've gotten to work with like uh home depot chick-fil-a uh, Dude Perfect, Alan Jackson, Laura Daigle, Maroon 5, the NFL, all these different kind of clients doing graphics, moving graphics, LED wall design, stadium graphic design, all those different things. So that's uh, a little bit about my business and kind of what I do. And um, just so there's clarity, when you talk about like LED walls, uh, Give us an example of what that would be, because I had yeah. to ask you that before I figured it out. <laughs> yes. So sorry. Like what is an I LED could... wall? like? If you're yeah. Yeah. If I say anything to inside or just be like, hey, that doesn't make sense. So um, LED wall, basically, if you go to a concert or something and the mu- musician or performers on stage, it's all the stuff that's happening behind them, right? They usually have these big screens. Uh, so a lot of times I'm in charge of creating content for those screens. So whether it's a CEO or a performer or talent on stage, I work closely with them or their leadership team or their management to create complimentary graphics to whatever's happening on stage. So for example, I just wrapped up a Chick-fil-A's corporate event called Next. It was out in San Diego and they had this huge LED wall, it's about 200 feet long. And the CEO, Andrew Cathy was standing there and he was talking about culture and culture going from like dead to a live culture and like, If you drift, it'll kind of drift towards a dead culture. And if you're intentional about what you do in your restaurant culture, it'll go towards a live culture. So what we did as a team is we created a photorealistic forest that overtook the entire screen behind them. And it started off super dead. So like dead trees, dead branches, fog, you know, almost a little like spooky or whatever, just kind of like dead and dying. And then as he was talking about like, hey, that's that's the drifting Right. But then when he started changing his messaging to this is going to be more of like the the live culture you want, we basically ramped in leaves growing on the trees, the sunlight coming up, like kind of like the fog lifting Mm -hmm. and basically did a full on transition behind him that matched his talk. So a lot of stuff like that, you know, sometimes it's as simple as just like manipulating music videos for Alan Jackson that goes behind him while he's playing or whatever. Yeah. Okay. That makes more sense. So the thing I'm thinking about is like at an NFL game, those banners that kind of go across like between the two levels or like the big yeah. screen up top. Yeah. Saying like, yeah, get loud. <laughs> but kind of, more, kind of stuff like I that. mean, even just that, 
but like more in, uh, intricate in the fact that you're you're making detailed imagery of like trees coming back to life from like Halloween spooky to or it could be as simple as like is play the powerball of... <laughs> you know like play the powerball and like little <laughs> ribbon boards around the stadium and it's just words play the powerball right like it's as simple as that all the way to sometimes I just like re-export a JPEG as a PNG for people like it, it's like kind of runs mm. the whole gamut <laughs> right so like can you make this into a PDF for me right like I'll do a little mm. bit of everything from that's the very and if it involves computer graphics you know I have the ability to kind of touch it or do something with it in a whatever the client wants kind of way awesome so how did you get into this field tell us a like how did you find yourself in the motion graphics field? And then how did you get started owning your own business doing that? And what kind of has been the yeah. journey? Yeah. Well, as you know, when we were in high school, we used to make all these stupid little videos and there were times when I was like, man, it'd be super cool to have this shot of Leland. I would love to make <laughs> his head blow up or I would love to pretend he's holding a gun that's actually shooting. <laughs> right. Even though we had no guns and it was like made of paper or plastic or old water gun or something. So I started getting involved in high school in the After Effects, which is a motion design program. And I went to college and I was like, okay, I could like do more of a traditional major at South Carolina, finance, engineering, business, whatever. I was like, or I can go into art and basically color my way through college. And that's what I chose to do. And it was super easy. <laughs> I loved I loved my major. I love my university. That's where I met my wife, some of my best friends. But uh my major was media arts. So at South Carolina, they didn't have a specific computer graphics major. So it focused a lot on film editing, video editing, camera operating, those kind of things. And I was interested in that, but I always got, got lit up about, you know, after we'd shoot something in college, taking it into the edit software and like doing effects on it, visual effects or doing graphics or title design or lower thirds or anything like that, that I just like really gravitated towards that stuff. And I realized, oh, there's this whole like niche little field inside of video editing called motion design that focuses just on that. So I kind of just went all in on that, started working on that. Uh, I, I still can't draw. I have an art major. I can't draw at all. I like terrible with a pencil. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm, I have terrible handwriting. So don't ask me to draw anything. I let the computer do that for me. But uh, graduated South Carolina, moved back to Atlanta where I'm from and got a job working at Crawford Media and specialized on working on stuff like The Walking Dead, Vampire Diaries, doing dailies for those shows, like real like low grunt work, right? For those shows. Cause I was just a new artist. And, uh, I remember looking around at all the people, all the other artists I was with, uh, in this area, they called like the hub, which is like where they put all of us weirdos. And so I remember looking at all these guys and be like, man, they're so good. Like they're so talented. SCAD, Art Institute, been doing it for 10 years. So I asked uh, Andrew, this guy I worked with, and I was like, hey, like, how do I get better? How do I get better at this like motion graphics thing, this art thing? And he's like, well, he said something I'll never forget. He's like, everybody's got good work inside of them. You just have to get through a lot of really, really crappy work to get to the good work, right? And that's different based mm. on talent, skill level, whatever. He goes, and a lot of people quit, right? Because they don't want to slog through so much of that crappy work to get to the good stuff, right? And I'm not saying what I do now is good. I still have a long, long ways to go. But I was like, okay, how can I shortcut that? How do I do that? He's like, you can't shortcut it. You just got to do a bunch of work. And I was like, that sounds like a shortcut to me. So I <laughs> did something called dailies where I did one art project a day for 720 days straight. I did that for two years. I did it on my wedding day. I did it each day on my honeymoon. I did it every day in a uh, art program or something that I was like unfamiliar with or was learning a lot of 3D programs, After Effects, Illustrator 2D programs. So I learned a lot about discipline and doing that mm. for two years straight and just doing something consistent for two years straight, whether I wanted to do it or not. Like I just did it, like just thinking about it and just making what I call the daily every day. So what that did is it got all my a lot of my bad work out of the way early. So I was able to do, I feel like what probably would have taken me eight to 10 years. I was able to condense that into about two years of work. Uh, so mm. which, which was great. Get all that out of the way. That helped me get a job at North point, which is a big, big church 
in the Atlanta area as the lead motion designer on their media team, making the videos for Andy Stanley, the pastor, their conferences. That's kind of where I started getting into conference event work, LED wall work. Um, I worked at North Point as a lead motion designer from 2015, 14 until the very end of 2018. And then January 1, 2019, I left North Point to go freelance and basically still work with North Point, still work with Crawford, work with all these people, but in my own capacity from my office at my house. And that's where I'm at. Mm. Right now. Yeah. Just been doing that for four years now. Wow. Gosh, I love the story of the dailies and just the, I mean, like the value that comes from something like that, just being so disciplined. I would love to know Joy's take on you making video graphics on your honeymoon every single day. Um, just the picture of that cracks me well, up. Well, I just, bit. I would like, I brought my laptop and I just wake up before she did. And it, I mean, like, those were not good dailies. It was like, all right, just throw a cube on there, like, throw, <laughs> throw a little wood texture on it, like, post it up the internet, call it done 25 minutes, right? Like, not thinking too much about it. But I mean, like, those are the stories that really like drive success when someone's like, yeah, I, I got super hyper disciplined to really work on my craft, to really learn a lot. Um, but you can do motion graphics as an employee. You did it for, you know, six years, five years between yeah. Crawford and North Point. Yeah. And so what prompted you to do the entrepreneurial route where like, I mean, North Point was probably paying you a salary. Crawford was paying you a salary. They had benefits. What prompted you uh -huh. to say, no, I'm going to go out and do this independently? It's kind of a slow burn. That's a really good question because, you know, I, and I, I can't speak to other fields or your field, right? I, there's Your field's a lot more regulated than my field because it's finance. I just like do art, right? So, <laughs> yeah, so like, like I have zero regulation. I kind of do whatever I want as long as I'm not embezzling money from a company or something, right? Like charge whatever I want, capitalism, sure. free market. So for me, when I was working at Crawford and North Point, I was still kind of freelancing a little bit on the side, but I was doing it nights and weekends, right? And so I would, I remember Joy had a big fear about me going freelance because when I was working at North Point, you know, I'd work from nine until four or 5 p.m., come home, walk the dog, and then work again on my freelance gigs my side hustle is what we called it from like seven to like 11 PM most nights. And so she was like, you're wow. working like 8 AM to 11 PM almost every day. When you go freelance, is that just going to completely ramp up? Right. And it did the opposite because I didn't have to spend eight hours of my day in meetings, pointless meetings where people were just telling me what they think about things that didn't mean or weren't important to me. You know, I could get, like mm -hmm. those four hours I was doing, which was like not an efficient four hours because it was from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. After I'd already worked full day and was burnt out, like I could put that earlier in the day, extend those four hours to six or seven hours and get be like triple as productive as I was before. So mm -hmm. that was a big thing for me was just kind of like starting slow nights and weekends, figuring it out. And then when I felt like I had a good enough base of clients to jump into the deep end of the pool and just like go on full on. That's awesome. Okay. So there's a couple of things there that I want to highlight. One is you were doing a side hustle. Like you were working as an employee, but then still taking on gigs 1099 as an independent contractor. Exactly. And kind of built your own name while you were working at Crawford or North Point. And then from there, kind of made that flip to say, well, now I'm still going to work with Crawford and North Point, but it's all going to be through this independent contractor, self-employed bucket on my own. Yeah. Um, and I love the idea of like, I was working around the clock. The fear was when I go full time and it's my gig, that's just going to be even more intense, all but actually, yeah. yeah, I'm able to, I'm actually able to do it in less amount of time because the time's so much more efficient. I think of, um, friends we have around town and, and I'm not about to jump into the, the politics of homeschool and public school, but, or like home, yeah, homeschool versus, um, schooling. But I know people who do homeschool their kids and they're like, it's just amazing how much you can get done in half the time <laughs> because you're not going through like lineup 
to go out here and we're going to like wait till everyone's quiet. And like, there's just some things when you're like, okay, I'm self-employed. It's just me. I can do this, that you can get things done in twice the time as opposed to having to go to, like you said, team meetings, random meetings. Yeah. And how much of a, of a day when someone goes to an office nine to five, there's all the studies that show like they're not actually working nine to five. You know, like the productivity no, yeah, the is really only in the, all in this the stuff. Few hour yeah. Window. yeah, it's a lot. Um, so there is something to be said about, hey, I can actually like go faster and do more in a shorter amount of time when I get totally. rid of kind of when I cut the fat of all these other things that I'm doing. Um, so how did you get your name out there for these like independent gigs? I mean, yeah. was it I built a relationship? through a gig at Crawford and then they hired me independently was where Crawford and North Point upset about that. In my industry, if you, you, it's just, that's just a foreign concept because you legally can't be duly registered. I can't be like a financial yeah. advisor for one firm and then doing it on the side. You have to be registered under either your own yeah. business or someone else's business. And that's it. Yeah. So it started for me when I started working at Crawford, I remember I was working on a job for Home Depot and, uh, the producer, so it's like Home Depot, ad agency, Crawford, and then I'm the artist working at Crawford. So I'm like four people removed, right? So anytime there's a change from the client at Home Depot, they're full, like I'm basically just getting an email thread of forwards and I have to like kind of hunt through and find the change. Well, you know how sometimes people forget mm. to delete the rest of the forward message underneath it, right? I got a forward from the producer asking about a change, but I saw the rest of the email thread underneath it. And I saw how much they were paying that Home Depot was paying DBDO and BBDO was paying Crawford. And so I saw that this video was $40,000 video. That's how much I was making in a year at Crawford. And I like, I saw that it was 40 grand <laughs> that they were paying BBDO. BBDO was basically paying Crawford like $15,000 to do this video. And I was getting paid essentially $15 an hour to make it. And it was not like a big time video. It was like a very like low key corporate training thing. And so at that point I realized I was like, wow, if I can work direct to client, like cut out this person, cut out this agency, cut out all these people, I can charge Home Depot 20 grand to do this video. They're getting a 50% discount. The same person's doing the work and I'm making a hundred X more, right? Than I was making before. Yeah. So what that did is that kind of like shifted my mindset very early in my career of how I wanted to slowly start positioning myself for a life of freelance because I, I knew I wanted to be my own boss. I knew I wanted to do those things. I just knew I wasn't quite ready yet. So I went to my boss at Crawford and said, hey, uh, I never signed a non-compete here that I wouldn't work for other places. I, I'm going to start taking on clients. I was very upfront with this. Like in my af you know, out of work hours, I was like, what kind of structure do you have around that? And they're basically like, as long as you're not working for direct competitors or you're not working for the clients we have on our books right now, you're free to do whatever you want. And I was like, great. So I signed that. Then when I worked at North Point, I, I kind of took it a step further and was like, hey, I, uh, I'm i not signing a non-compete at all. And, and they're a church, so it was like a little more chill, but they were like, okay. <laughs> so I basically, in my initial sign up with North Point, I told them, I was like, hey, I'm, I'm going to be freelancing nights and weekends. And if that's going to be a problem for you, it it won't, like, I'm not working here, essentially. Uh, and they were like, no, that's not a problem for us. And in fact, what I loved about North Point is uh, in a lot of ways, they encourage their people to go out and do stuff nights and weekends, as long as it wasn't affecting your nine to five job or your Sunday responsibilities. They're like, yeah, go work for Chick-fil-A, go work for the NFL, go do whatever, because that makes you a better artist and we get a better artist for the same amount of pay because you're learning and cutting mm. your teeth on all these other jobs. Right. And you're learning new techniques and new systems and being around different people. Just the diversity of that is really important. So for me, a lot of it was that is like how I was positioning myself. And then the other aspect of it is I kind of call myself a professional coattail writer, right? Like, one person hires me at an at like agency A producer and yeah, agency A hires me. I do a good job for them. I do good work. That relationship lasts for a year, a couple of years, whatever. And then producer A gets hired by agency B. So they go over there, right? But now agency A still is hiring me because I've made good relationships, not just with that one producer, but all the people mm -hmm. in that studio. But now 
uh, you know, producer A working for agency B still is like, oh, we trust Will. So then I now I have two studios I'm working for, right? And it kind of just matriculates out like that. So as my clients grow and move up in their careers, you know, as long as I continue to have like a solid relationship with them built on trust, communication, you know, speed, all the things that are important in my industry, I kind of just like keep growing in that way as well. Gosh, that's so that's <clears throat> that makes so much sense. And also would never work like 40 years ago when like no because people, no, people stayed people, at, yeah stayed at the same job. job like yeah they like moved up within a company but now you're you're literally actually profiting off the fact that people get paid more to change companies and to kind of say you know I'm going to go take a job at this firm and then this firm and you're kind of just riding along with them but then eat, just adding not only new clients but like new firms to your <laughs> bucket yeah of, that's awesome that it's been fun because I just love working with cool, interesting people. And like the more I've been doing this, I've only been doing freelance for four years now, right? Like, yeah, four years. The, the more interesting people I get to meet that I would never have met otherwise. And it's usually a connection of a connection of a connection, or it's like, Hey, you did an event with this guy who was the audio guy. And you guys like got dinner together while you were at on tour for this event. And then like his wife runs this company. And so now he really liked you. And it's like, Oh, I know Will can do all this cool stuff telling his wife and his wife hires you. And it's like, you just get to meet all these fun people that like you otherwise would have no way of meeting. And that's what I love about my job. Yeah, that gosh, that's so awesome. Um, okay. So you have worked up the ranks to where you're now doing, you know, gigs for the likes of Chick-fil-A at their leadership conferences you know, major musicians at their concerts, NFL, but it's just you. You are a solopreneur. You do not, it's not like someone can walk into Fort Studios. Is that what it's called? A solopreneur? Like a, that's my word for it is like you're a solo I entrepreneur. Um, I didn't come up with it. There's someone else did, but it, it was catchy. And so I'm just going with it. Um, but it's not like I can walk into your office and be greeted by your whole team. And you've got a whole army of people kind of like Crawford did. Crawford gets brought in and they've got a team of people doing it that they're paying. But I know you and I also know you don't want to have the big team. Like you're not trying to bring on an assistant and employees. So speak to that a little bit about a why you you're like, I'm not trying to build a whole big firm and two how you scale and handle the quantity of the work there. Yeah. So they're kind of two sides of the same coin. The reason I don't want to bring on a whole big team and hire employees and do all this stuff is it was a real big tension for me. And I talked to you about this like early on in my freelance career. I was like, well, do I grow? Do I stay this kind of solopreneur kind of guy? Like, how do I do this? And what I realized, I was like, you know what? Like, I'm making plenty of money doing just my thing right now, right? And I, I saw from the failures of some other companies in Atlanta, a lot of the reason these motion design companies at places fail is is they get too big too quick, right? And they they overstaff and there's way too much overhead. And it's like my overhead is like in a sub a subscription to Adobe, like which is fifty dollars a month and like <laughs> Wi Fi. Like that's literally my overhead. I could I can probably my entire overhead for the year is probably less than ten grand. So to be able to stay really lean and mean allows me to pivot and work on things a lot more quickly, which is one of the reasons my clients hire me so often is they know I can get stuff done really, really fast. The other part of that is if I mm. am doing bigger jobs or bigger things, I can subcontract out 1099 employees, whoever I want, right? Like, and I have relationships with other motion designers, graphic designers, video editors, uh, DP film guys, like, VFX guys, all these different types of people, color artists. And I can just like be like, hey, come on in, join me in this project. How much would you charge me for this? I build that into my estimate, send it to the client. Then I'm just paying them out of the big lump sum I'm getting from the client. I'm paying out these 1099 employees. So if I need to flex up for a big job, I can just bring in a few artists. Like I did that for a tour a few years ago. I brought in a graphic designer and another motion designer kind of helped me out. And then I focused on just creative directing, like getting the vision right, working with the client. And I paid them 1099 and I'm not responsible for them as employees. I'm not responsible for their families, uh, their, their own responsibility for that. And I can kind of, you know, 
flex to grow as big or as small as I need, which is nice on a per project basis, which is cool. Yeah. And that, I mean, again, that makes sense. But the interesting thing to me is, so you're at Crawford, you see this email where like company A is being paid 45 grand. They're hiring Crawford huh. for 15 grand of that. Yeah. And then Crawford's paying you. And you were like, I, I just could cut out these middlemen. And so you did. And now you're uh -huh. com the company getting paid 45 grand and saying, all right, well, I'll subcontract the quote unquote Crawford. If it could be a company, could be an independent person to do some of that yeah. work. Is that kind of what you're saying is like, as opposed to having employees, I'm just going to subcontract out pieces of the project that I need done in a timely fashion Yeah, in order to be exactly able to have right. the labor to scale and do more yeah. projects. I would say though, I okay. mean, so uh, I, I only, I only do about like, I probably only hire about 30 to $40,000 of work a year in subcontractors. So not a ton. Uh, I try to do it all myself. The only time I'll typically hire a subcontractor is if I am super, super booked and just need help. Or if they have a skill set that I don't have, like they're really good at this one thing. Like I, like I said, I can't draw, right? So if someone hires me to do a project that requires mm -hmm. a lot of illustration, I'm like, okay, let me bring in my friend Charmaine. She's an unbelievable illustrator. So, and I've worked with her a bunch. So it's like, let's you know, I can pitch the vision to her. She just gets it. She draws some stuff, gives it to me. I can animate it and I can kind of stay in my lane. That's awesome. In my industry, we, um, it's very different, a different industry, but there is the piece of like, are you a solo practitioner where you just come and the only advisor on the team is Leland and Leland is the admin and the planner and the account opener and trader and all that. And then there's the the enterprise on the opposite side, which would be like the, you know, Edward Jones of the world that, you know, uh, there's thousands of advisors. You're not going to get much detailed, like individual stuff. They kind of have the, a lot of, not necessarily one size fits all, but it's just, you know, huge. And they've scaled a ton because they have all the advisors able to do that. And so there's the law of large numbers. And then there's uh -huh. the middle ground of like the boutique firm where it's like, there's, you know, two or three advisors, a small team, and there have been more and more studies coming out about like what which one actually ends up paying the advisor, the owner the most and which one actually creates the best quality of life. And it's amazing how the solo just blows that out of the water. And so a lot of the like really? business consultants in my industry have been saying, you know, if you want to do if you grow your team, if you're going to scale and you're going to add people, you have to make sure that's exactly how you want to do it. Like that's you have to be passionate about having a team or creating this big enterprise because you will probably actually take home as the owner a little bit less money and have more responsibility along the way uh -huh. because of what you're saying to your point of like, I'm able to keep my, you know, overhead super low. I'm able to be very flexible about how I operate. Um, and so even though I, I only have so much capacity for so many clients, I'm taking home a lot more of each client's fee than if I have a team where I've got to pay payroll and I've got, you know, all yeah. these extra compliance things I need to pay for and all, all these things. So that's, it's just very interesting to me that that, I feel like that is not how it's always been in the entrepreneurial world. Right. I feel like we've kind of for years and decades and decades, it was like, build a corporation, build, make, uh -huh. get employees, scale, get really big. And now we're kind of seeing this weird switch where in the virtual world, you can be a solopreneur, you can subcontract, you can keep your overhead really low, run lean, and still get enough business to pay yourself and create the quality of life you want because you're like, I'm not managing people. <laughs> more people, what, more problems in many yeah. ways. What I love um, about that is it allows me to, yeah. to, yeah, it just, it allows me to be really selective in what projects and clients I take on, right? Like if I, if I had a full team, I would feel like I had to say yes to a lot more stuff so we can stay booked. Right. But if it's just me, mm. I know like I'm looking over here at my board, like I'm, I'm pretty full for the rest of February, March and April. Right. And that's because I can be really selective about the clients and projects I work with. So I work with people who I already have a good relationship with. I know exactly how the project's going to go, or maybe I don't know this client. They're a new client, but they're coming at me with a huge budget that I would love to kind of like play with or figure out and start trying to see if we can establish a really solid relationship 
you know, a new solid relationship. So it allows me to be really selective. Mm. So when some kid on Twitter DMs me and says, can you design my YouTube banner for $30? I can say no. Right. <laughs> because I don't need to do yeah, that. Yeah. No, thank you. So yeah. Um, it just allows, it allows like exactly what you said, kind of the flexibility. Which, and, and I feel like that is the key to preventing burnout too, right? Where like, if you are taking on every project for every single person and each project is different and some are just tedious and annoying and just taking up unnecessary time, you're just going to get into burnout. Whereas if you're in a place where you're like, I can be selective, I can choose the type of project or type of person I want to work with. It allows you to actually provide more value to that person. And then your business is providing you more value because you're actually enjoying getting out of bed every day and going to work and not just spinning your wheels. Where I think a lot of self-employed entrepreneurs, especially in the early days, are just trying to, you know, get food on the table. And so they're taking on anything. And if they don't find systems out of that, they're just going to spin their wheels and um, burn themselves out really quickly and be like, why is this business not getting me where I want to go. That's um, something, but you've done a really good job of like, I think you go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. There must be a little delay. I, there, like that's something that you mentioned that I kind of want to talk about a little bit that goes kind of like towards community. Some is like, I see so many freelancers in my industry get very like, Oh, I have to say yes to everything. I have to say yes to everything. And when you feel like you have to say yes to everything, it's because you're operating from like a, almost like a scarcity mindset. Like, uh, they'll never be enough. They'll never be enough for me. So I just mm -hmm. have to say yes to anything that comes across my desk. And something that's been great for Joy and I, as I kind of did this and she started her own thing in therapy too, it's like, like, because we have such a solid community around us, I don't have the fear, like you and Lindy are our community, like a friend's family are our community. Like, I don't have the fear that like, I don't have to say yes to everything and we won't eat. Cause I know my community will make sure I eat if like mm. no jobs come in. Right. So like having that community around us, right. That biblical community, that group of friends that all like, like kind of operate in the same mindset. We're all like, Hey, we're just going to share what we have and be together. And if you need something like I'm here for you, like, let me fly down and see, or let me fly up or, Oh, Hey, like you haven't made mm. any money in like eight weeks just because the world, something crazy happened, with the economy or something like, can let me send you like a $200 DoorDash gift card, like stuff like that, right? Like a lot of people don't have that. And because I do have that, it gives me so much mm. more peace about saying no, right? Which then makes me a better artist and a better dad and a better family member because I'm not burnt out all the time. And I totally attribute that to the safety net I feel like I have because of my friends and family. Mm. Wow. I mean that, yeah. That is so powerful. And I could not agree more. I feel so humbled and like there's such a, a beauty to that. And it, like you said, not everyone has that. It is such a, a unique and powerful thing. I mean, for Lindy and I in the last year, we had a, a son who we love, but had a lot of medical complexities. And I mean, I feel like we, that was within six months of quitting my very stable job and starting a business and, um, just having that safety net of people who like love us and care for us and show up for us. I mean, was so honoring and I mean, literally kept us afloat. It kept, it made me feel like I can be present with my family and not be so stressed about work because we have this, we're just, you know, so fortunate to have that. And I know you do too. And so that's, I mean, yeah, just that, what you just said really hits a heartstring for me because we were the benefactors of that in a very tangible way over yeah. the last 12 months. Um, so what surprised what surprised you most about your journey through self-employment? Because you, you know, studied this in college, graduated, got a job as an employee, kind of saw, hey, I'm getting paid $15 an hour. I can do this. You know, I can cut out these middlemen. Uh -huh. So did that, but did it on the side, kind of built your side hustle and then launched and have kind of soared from there. Um, what has surprised you most about that journey? It's a great question. I think what surprised me most is... Uh, I mean, maybe this is counterintuitive to what I just said, but there's just this fear when you go freelance, you're like, are people mm -hmm. going to call me? Like, are people going to email me? Do people want me to work on their projects? And it's a little bit of imposter syndrome mixed with a little bit of just uncertainty that I've never done this before full time. And so 
the thing that surprised me the most is like that people actually email me and like want me to work on stuff, right? Like I still get shocked mm. that people just like email me. And I, I think another thing that surprised me that kind of goes hand in hand with that is I thought I'd have to be doing a lot more like cold emailing, door knocking, like cold calling people like, hi, I'm Will, I'm an emotion designer. Can I like help you on your <laughs> spot for like AB, your new ABC show? <laughs> and like that has not really had to been the case. I, I've reached out to studios and artists in Atlanta that I think are super talented just to let them know, hey, I think you're super talented. I'd love to like grab a beer with you and talk about this stuff, right? Um, or like, how how did you do mm. that? Like, I, I have no idea how you made that. Can I like buy you dinner and you tell me how you made that, right? Like, I thought I'd be having to do a lot of cold emailing, cold calling, and that really hasn't been the case. I've been super fortunate um, and lucky that people, for some reason, even during COVID and crazy economic up and downs and stuff, like, you still email me. Like, it's kind of amazing. Don't know why they do it, but I'm glad they do. Mm. I love the like, you know, I feel so confident in my community. And also, I don't think it's a but. I don't think it's con contradictory. I think it's an and. Like, there's so much peace in knowing that I've got a safety net of community around me. And are we going to end up homeless under the bridge? Yes. If I do this on my <laughs> yeah. own because no one will call me, which is like the funny thing that every entrepreneur has the fear of when they first launch is like, you know, will, will this work? I mean, that's. The like total head trash that we tell ourselves, you know, like I'm an imposter. They'll find me out. No one will call. You know, if I raise my fees, no one will hire me. Mm -hmm. All all the things that we tell ourselves that just limit our, limit ourselves is um, totally there. It's head trash. But I I love that. That's what surprised you the most is like this actually works. And I I want other entrepreneurs to hear that as like you can do this. People will call. There's a lot of people in the world who need a lot of services you can make it happen if you are good at what you do and you're faithful in it. Something, what was, um, what was, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Something one of my buddies, Steven told me when I was in college, he, and this kind of stuck with me and it helps give me a little bit of like clarity in thinking about that is like, if you know one more thing in a subject than somebody else to that person, you're the expert. So like to me, mm. you're the expert in finance because you know not just one more thing about finance i mean you know a billion more things in finance than me right like but to you i may be the expert in motion design because but even like if i was talking to another motion designer that was maybe a year or two behind me in their career or their journey they may view me as an expert or a client that does a lot of video editing but doesn't do a lot of motion design if you know just one more thing in a subject than somebody else you're the expert to that person and like reframing your brain to think like mm -hmm. okay I'm the expert. How would I do this? I would do it this way. And you just tell them that. And they're like, oh, that's great. You're the expert. You must know. <laughs> Even though you're like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Right? Yeah. You're like, I'm still a child. I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. Yeah. But I'm 32 with a successful business. Yeah. But I think to that point, there's that, there's that old saying, you know, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. It's like, you only have one eye. You have no depth perception, but you can see better than a blind person. Yeah. It's kind of this, you know, idea of like, like you said, always continuing to grow, but realizing like you have something to give when you know more than the next person, even if it's just a little bit more than the next uh -huh. person. Um, What was the low point for you in the journey? Yeah. Low point uh, was, was probably COVID. Um, and that's probably a lot of entrepreneurs low point because like that was starting the very beginning of my second year freelance. So I was like, okay, I got this. Like year one is in the books. I'm ready to increase my income. And I had like, uh, at that time I was really focusing in live event work, right? Like doing shows, doing mm -hmm. tours, with artists, corporate events. And I had a bunch of gigs lined up, maybe a hundred thousand, hundred and twenty thousand dollars in gigs that I was going to do. And then March hit and they, uh, you know, they started just dropping because nobody was meeting in person. And so there was definitely mm -hmm. that, uh, that uncertainty and fear really crept in again. Right. And it, and had to, I had to pivot my business a little bit to be like, okay, if I'm not doing live event work, maybe I need to start focusing on a different market to start pitching myself to. So I actually started doing medical animation a little bit during that time working on medical animation videos, pharmaceutical videos, all these things. And so 
being able to do that helped a ton with my buddy Daniel, who's a very talented sound designer here in town. He has some medical clients that I work with. So that was super helpful. And then I think when people realized like, oh, the world's not just going to open back up after a month, right? Like my clients like Chick-fil-A mm-hmm. and all that are like, we're going to just really dive into virtual. So all the events, they do like 15 events a year, all went to Zoom calls. And they're like, well, we don't want just regular Zoom calls. So they wanted like what we call virtual events, right? Where it's not as good mm-hmm. as an in-person event, but you're here. And so I was making Zoom backgrounds. I was making, you know, pits, which is like picture in picture stuff to like, here's a CEO, but there's like a nice Chick-fil-A background behind him. And then here's the president and the COO. And they're all having this like Zoom talk that we're recording live, but it's like got graphics all over it, a little more polished than like a regular Zoom call. So it was weird, man, like to kind of flex and go into like virtual events, and medical animation, just things I wasn't super comfortable with. But what was great is I built up those tools during that time. So now I do virtual events, can still do my live event work, just pitched another medical animation video the other day. So it kind of like forced me to work on different skill sets and tool sets. Yeah, it kind of like made you have to be resilient and find new avenues and now you have the old avenues back too so you're like yeah. great <laughs> yeah i could do the live event the virtual event the medical the yeah. you know um also medical animation talk about a field there's just so many jobs in the world i know i like talk about a field that i would not even think about is no. that medical field especially with COVID. Needs. especially with COVID. Uh, like people needing to figure out like show the smart people needing to figure out how to show you know not smart people like me how covid works and so they use videos yeah. to show how okay, like you know, the little virus looks like this and it goes around and attaches here and here and these little neutrophils and IL-17s, whatever, just like, yeah. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's like, I, I'm a consumer of that stuff and also like never think about the fact that someone actually had to create that. Yeah. So that's awesome. Um, okay. So this is a podcast about success, but if you pulled anybody on the street, they would, and ask them what is success how do you define it? You'd get a different answer for every single person. So for you, how would you define success and how will you know if and when you've achieved it? Yeah. So for me, defining success, and I'm sure other people you've had on the show probably said something similar. It's like not necessarily a dollar amount. Although if I made like $20 million doing this thing, I'd be like, yep, that's a success. I'm retiring and going to go like live in the Keys or something. But um, (laughs) so maybe it is a little financial, but for me, really, the fact that I I feel successful now, honestly, not to like toot my own horn or anything, but mm. the fact that I can, like, I get to do a job that I enjoy. I get to work with people I enjoy. I get to do it on my timeline and time frame from my office in my basement with my dog and my son. Like, those are all wins. And the fact that I can have such a flexible time. Mm. So like, if he's sick or something, I can just like, kind of punt some projects and work on them at night or do it the next day. Like the flexibility, the ability to do something I love and enjoy the ability to do something creative, like all I'm kind of just like, man, I feel like I'm sort of living the dream right now, which is why I don't want to hire employees. Like why rock the boat, right? Mm-hmm. Like kind of got it, got it good right now. I might as well just keep this thing going as long as the good Lord will let it go. I, I, I'm struck by that in the just in the fact that you were talking about earlier, you enjoy having a scarcity mind, like the difference between scarcity mindset, like we'll never have enough. We need to take on everything versus an abundance mindset. And I think an abundance mindset says I'm already successful. Like I've got a great yeah. job. I've got a great family. I've got a great lifestyle. And what more could I want? Whereas I, th- I just think that's so countercultural of everyone. A lot of entrepreneurs even saying like just a little bit more. If I can just have a little bit more, if I can of whatever it is, time, you know, money, clients, or, you know, freedom. I just feel like we we all just are are pining after the next best thing. And so I love to hear you, you as as a successful entrepreneur saying, like, I am successful. And it's not necessarily because of the money. It's, you know, because there's so much other beauty going on in my life from the quality of my work, the like the quality of my life is I'm already successful. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, and, and the money's part oh, of man. it. Well, money, money's part of it too, right? Because like, because you make enough, you can afford 
to do other things, right? So it's, it's sort of like a mm -hmm. yes and kind of thing, right? It's not it's not about the money, but like the money sure is helpful. Totally. And and I when I work with my clients, I tell people like when they're thinking about hiring me, if <clears throat> if more money is your goal, if that's the goal itself, we're not going to be a good fit because you're going to fire me because you're going to fire any financial advisor because you'll never have enough if more money is the goal. But if more time with my family, if, you know, the ability to have more freedom or, okay. you know, live in the area or the type of home I want, if that's the goal, then we can do a lot with your money and you're going to need money to do it. And let's like figure that out. Like money is a tool more than the goal itself. And I think that's what you're speaking to is like, yeah, obviously money is important and a huge help when building the life you want. But that alone, what I'm hearing you say is like that alone is not the, the key to success. Agreed. It's a tool to achieve the success. The success being like, I can be with my son and my dog during the day. I can be flexible. I can work from anywhere. Or I can, you know, make the money, do it how I want kind of thing. Exactly. Exactly. Thanks for having me on, man. This was great. Oh, man. Well, you know, I love you. And it's so fun to get to hang out on a Friday morning. But um, thank you so much for giving us your time and being on the Self-Employment Success Podcast.